If you believe that you are saved by works, if you believe that you gain entrance into heaven by what you do, if that's your belief system, then this is the question that must follow. Have I done enough? If you believe you are saved by what you do, the question that must necessarily follow is, have, have I done enough? That's the curse of religion right there. It's a curse. You think what's going on here is religious? It's not. This is relationship. This is relationship. This isn't religion. Religion is cursed because religion is about what's on us. Religion is essentially a faith in self. You gotta know that. And, and not just religious forms that call themselves Christians, all religions across this world. At the end of the day, it's a faith ultimately in self in what I do to try to please some kind of higher being so I gain access and favor into whatever I believe is next. It's faith in self. It's not faith in Christ. And if our faith is in self and not in Christ, we have no hope. First year I got saved, this simple little book I read, and there's this one part in this book that was such a little gospel tool that just made so much sense of my life, but then also to share my faith with others. It's just this, and you should have heard this before. It just says this, religion is spelt do, D-O. Religion is about what I have to do to be in greater favor with God, or whatever it is. But then Christianity is spelt Done. Because it's already been to solo Cristo. The work is finished. So I don't have to do anything. It's been done for me. It's the relationship I place my faith and trust and love in Christ. And therefore I have grace that's given to me as a gift. I don't have to do anything. This is a wonderful, powerful, tiny, simple gospel tool for you and I to take with us every day. As we explain to people, as we meet people, everyone is a system of religion. Everyone. And everyone thinks it's about what they have to do in one way or another. That's not the gospel. The gospel says it's been done. Now believe. And as we believe in the fruit that comes from our lives in love for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not due. This is why we have learned that Martin Luther, before he was truly saved... He was obsessed with his sin. We learn that Martin Luther would spend hours in confession, desperately seeking to uncover any sin that would block his way to God. He would confess for hours and hours, and then he would leave, and as he was leaving confession, he would remember more sins and then rush back and confess again. This got to the point where Luther began to drive his superiors crazy, and finally, one of them said to Luther, quote, Look here, Brother Martin, if you're going to confess so much, why don't you do something worth confessing? Kill your mother or father. Commit adultery. Stop coming in here with such flummery, empty words, and fake sins. Fascinating. Uh, but you see, Luther never had peace. He never had peace because his salvation was ultimately up to faith in self. And whenever our faith is in self, self will never prove to be a savior. You know, you think one of the most popular self-esteem phrases in our world right now, just believe in yourself. You just have to believe in yourself. Really? No. I don't want to believe. I don't want to believe in this. No. No, that doesn't work. This is no good, man. This is messed up. This is sinful. This is corrupt. This is depraved. This, this hasn't got me anywhere good ever. I can't believe in this. It doesn't work. It never has, and it never will. What is needed is faith in one beyond this, beyond self. Faith in one who can deliver us, not these man-made band-aid solutions that never work. 
What is needed is faith in one to actually save us, not temporarily make us feel better about ourselves. Again, it was this massive need and dilemma which would lead Luther to discover through sola scriptura the glorious truth of sola fide. And sola fide says, ultimately, we are justified by faith alone. Faith alone. For that, we turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 5. Please do. Please do today. Change your life. On this 500th anniversary of Reformation Day and Reformation Day weekend, what a beautiful text to turn to. Romans 5, verse 1 and 2. And the content of sola fide, justification by faith. It's just right. And thank you, Lord, for bringing us here to this time and this day. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, oh, there it is. Since we've been justified by faith, we have peace. Peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Packed already. Theology everywhere. Can you see it? It's awesome. Through him, Christ. We have also obtained access by faith. Ah, there it is again, by faith. I want to circle those two phrases and Draw a line between them for next time you come to this place. Access by faith into this grace. Wow. In which we stand. And we rejoice in hope, notice, of the glory of God. Now what we embark upon just within verse 1, it has been called the material principle of the Reformation. Romans 5.1, building off of all of Romans leading up to this point with the word therefore, we are justified by faith. Justification by faith, the material principle of the Reformation. Why? Why the material principle of the Reformation? Because if you take out sola fide, you have no Christian faith. Because the entire belief system of Christianity is by faith. If you remove faith, you take out the cornerstone. The foundation starts to crumble. If there's no exercise of faith, there's no salvation. Because we are saved by grace through faith. Through faith. Faith is the instrument by which we are saved as we place that in Christ and then receive grace. If there's no sola fide, then the living water becomes contaminated through pollution. It doesn't work anymore. There must be faith, justification by faith. This is why Luther would eventually be led to say this, justification by faith is the article that is the head and the cornerstone of the church. You remove sola fide, you undermine the entire Christian faith. Let's just look at our summary in our series thus far. The five solas, again, sola scriptura, crystal, gatia, sola deo gloria, next week, sola fide. But see, sola fide is that which unlocks the rest. See, this is what you have to see right here. I'm so thankful to our brilliant graphic designer, JC. Look what he did, this little key. Isn't that clever? Isn't that so clever? Love that so much. Faith is the instrument or the key that unlocks the other solas because without faith you cannot see, especially in terms of Christo and Gratia, of course, because faith is placed in Christ, which then faith receives the gift of grace. Without faith, these things are locked. They never truly become aware of Christ alone and grace alone and then living for God's glory alone. It's faith that unlocks the other solace. No wonder Hebrews 11 says, without faith it's impossible to please God. So this takes us then to the unpacking of this beautiful, 
massively important doctrine, sola fide, for th- point number one is this. Sola fide, we are justified by faith. Not trying to be clever, trying to be accurate and true and right. Justified by faith. The first phrase we encounter in Romans 5 is what? It's the phrase, therefore, therefore, since we've been justified by faith. Now, what Paul is doing here, he is referring to his life-changing argument of the previous three chapters. And in chapter 3 specifically, Paul is hammering out with power the doctrine of justification. He's communicating to his Jewish and Gentile audience this. There is no one who on his or her own is capable of true righteousness. No one can do that. If man seeks to gain favor with God by their own effort, they will fail every single time. Why, why? Because as Paul explains in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, no one is righteous, no, not one. Is the Bible clear? No one is righteous, no, not one. In Romans 3, verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God's glory is over here. Humanity is over here. Because humanity has sinned, they will never, ever be able to jump and reach the glory of God. They will always fall short on their own into the chasm of sin, which leads to death. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Romans 3, verse 20 on the screen for you. For by works of the law, again, when people try to suggest the Bible is not clear on these things, let's let's just really look at Sola Scriptura for a second, okay? For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight. The Bible is so clear. We cannot be justified by our works. And before we go any further, it's vitally important that we all get on the same page, because some of you right now, and Rightly so, are asking the question, wait, wait, just, just to justification, just of what? What is justification exactly? And that's a fantastic question, so let's make sure we're all on the same page. Here's a definition of justification. This is massively important. This is beautiful. This is taken from Wayne Grudem. Justification is this, okay? You gotta get this, okay? If you don't know this, you gotta get this, okay? You gotta get this. The rest of your life, take it with you, take it with you, take it with you. Be a student of God's word, learn, learn. It's everywhere in scripture. You gotta know it. It's the instantaneous legal act of God. It's a legal term. Imagine a courtroom. It's an instantaneous, so it's not a process. Instantaneous legal act of God in which he first thinks of our sins as forgiven and as Christ's righteousness as belonging to us, okay? Remember the great exchange? This is the great exchange. Justification is the great exchange. My sin on Christ, his righteousness on me. We say that's not fair. God's like, I know, I love you so much. This is what I do. When you believe in me, this is what I do. Secondly, justification means that we are declared to be righteous in the sight of God. Before Christ, guilty, deserving of death and punishment. After Christ, born again, converted, justified, We are now righteous, not our righteousness, Christ's righteousness on us. God sees his son in us. He puts down the gavel, innocent, sentenced to eternal life in heaven with me in glory forever and ever. Justified by faith. Justified by faith. And once we are justified, we are innocent then before God. Just think about it. Being justified means God no longer sees your sin. I no longer sees my sin. God no longer sees my sin. That's that's amazing. And yet this is what justification by faith does. And all my sins placed on Christ. See, justification by faith becomes an astoundingly powerful and awesome doctrinal truth. See, but now we see with greater clarity. Why is Paul taking so much time to communicate this in all these legal terms and some of these languages that's hard to understand, yet he goes over it again and again. He does this because no one can be justified in the sight of God by their own doing. It only comes by faith in Jesus Christ. 
So again, in chapter 3 of Romans, Paul's explaining that all people are in desperate need to be innocent before God because of their sin. And so with the need so clearly communicated in the book of Romans, now he explains the way to be justified, faith, sola fide. This is how we are saved, by faith in Christ to receive grace. Romans 4, 5 on the screen for you. And to the one who does not work. Again, how clear is scripture? To the one who does not work, but believes in him, God, who justifies the ungodly. Listen, ready? His, her faith is counted as righteousness, justification. Faith, believing in Christ. You are justified. You are counted as righteous because of what Christ has done for you. So Paul is carrying this beautiful argument all the way into Romans 5, verse 1. So look at the first word in Romans 5, verse 1. What is it? Therefore. See what he's doing now? He's got this massive train of momentum, of theological glory. And he's bringing it all along. And he comes to Romans 5, verse, verse 1, the first word, therefore. Therefore, because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Because therefore, we cannot work to earn our salvation. Because therefore, as we believe in Jesus Christ, we are justified by faith. Therefore, he says, since we have been justified by faith, sola fide. And now you throw this truth in the combination of sola scriptura. Sola fide, justified by faith, and sola scriptura, and the massive beauty of truth. You throw this in the context of the Reformation, and boom, explosion. Explosion of light. An explosion of the gospel. Listen, an explosion that destroys the false gospel of works. Isn't it interesting in the context of Galatians? That Paul says, if anyone preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. He says it again, the very next verse. If anyone preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. What was the false gospel he was primarily referring to in Galatians? A gospel of works. A gospel of the Jewish people believing they are saved by what they do, as opposed to faith in Jesus Christ. If anyone preaches another gospel. He says, even if I come to you and preach a gospel other than what you're hearing from me right now. If an angel comes and preaches the gospel different than the justification by faith in Christ and receiving grace, let him be accursed. Here's what J.A. Packer says about this all-important truth on the screen for you, these beautiful quotes here. He says this, so where Rome had taught a piecemeal salvation, okay, now think about that. A piecemeal salvation, here's step one of salvation, we gotta do this step two to be saved, and step three, you get a little bit more salvation, Okay to be gained by stages through working, this is such a great phrase, a sacramental treadmill. The reformers now proclaimed a unitary, unitary salvation. See the difference there? Piecemeal, a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit, have I done, have I done enough? But then the reformers come in, open up God's word, solo scriptura, and say, whoa, 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 solo Christo, solo gratia, solo fide, no, 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 once for all, unitary salvation, all or nothing, to be received in its entirety here and now, how? By self-abandoning faith. See what happens? Forget self, faith now in the promise of God and in the God and the Christ of that promise as set forth in the pages of the Bible. Then Packer went on to say this on the screen. Rome had said God's grace is great for through Christ's cross and his church salvation. Now notice here, so it sounds good so far. You're like, well, God's grace is great. For through the cross of Christ and the church, now is the problem, salvation is possible for all who will work and suffer for it. So come to the church and toil. See, that was, that was the Roman church. You come earn your salvation. You come and, and, and you beg God. You, you, you do the work so you can gain favor with God through the things that we've placed before you which aren't found in Scripture. Packer says, but the reformers said God's grace is greater. 
greater, not just great, it's greater, greater than all. For through Christ's cross and his spirit salvation, see that? Christ's cross, and not the church now, the spirit salvation, Holy Spirit, full and free, full, free, with its unlimited guarantee of eternal joy, is given once and forever to all who believe, I love this line, so come to Christ and trust and take, receive by faith. And you never have to worry again because Christ has done it all. See, therefore, justification is and can only be by faith and faith alone. Faith, faith, justification by faith. Faith in its biblical form is a personal trust and reliance. I trust you fully, Jesus Christ. I give to you my entire life. It's not half of me. Lord, I just, I, I totally rely on you. I place my everything upon Jesus Christ. Now, within the medieval period, faith was taught as a virtue. Now, see the difference here. So, as in my faithfulness or my loyalty to God. Now, see the difference there? The faith of the gospel, the faith of Romans 5, 1 right here is justified by faith. My entire reliance, I place my faith with, uh, outside of me. Jesus, you are my everything. My faith in 100% you. The faith in the medieval church, it was taught, it's subtle. The faith is, no, 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 my faithfulness, my loyalty. So it's actually a faith within. It's I, I find myself faithful, I earn my way to God. Two massively different concepts of faith. See, so the words are thrown around, but the meanings are vastly, vastly different. By the way, take a look at what the Council of Trent said on this issue of justification by faith, okay? Now, read this carefully. This is what the Council of Trent in the 1500s, as we learned, okay? They said this. And again, this is, this is the hard part for me. They reaffirmed this in the 1960s. It's never been refused or rebutted. It's, this is what the church believes today. If anyone says that the justice, justification, if anyone says that the justification received is not preserved and also increased before God through good works. So if anyone says, sola fide, essentially, if anyone says that justification is just by faith alone, and that faith is not both preserved and increased before God through good works. If anyone says that, which is exactly what I'm saying today and the word of God saying today, okay? But that the said works are merely the fruits and signs of justification obtained. Okay, so we would say, where do works come in? Works are the fruit of genuine faith in Christ. Works follow. Where there's genuine faith, there must be works. But works do not produce the justification. Works are an indication, the fruits and the signs of true faith in Christ. If you're born again, you start to live like it, okay? So if anyone says that justification are just fruits and signs of justification attained, but not the cause of the increase thereof. If anyone says we're saying today, let him be anathema. Essentially, if anyone preaches justification sola fide, let him be anathema. And so if you believe that, you are then confined automatically in some form to a system of works. Right? If you believe that you are justified by faith as you prove it and you increase, you preserve it by what you do then you are caught then in a system of works which eventually led to the sacramental system within the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church holds to seven sacraments. Baptism, Eucharist, Confirmation, Penance, or also known as Confession, the Anointing of the Sick, Holy Orders or Ordination for Clergy Priests, and then Marriage. Seven sacraments. See, each sacrament was said to dispense grace. But here's the problem. No one sacrament dispensed enough grace to save a sinner. And even worse, 
No one could be assured of their salvation because no one had enough grace to gain admittance into heaven. So think about that. Earn your grace, but you never earn enough. Earn grace, but you never know if you got enough to get into heaven. So you walk around in this tormented state of never knowing if you've done enough. Now notice how ripe then this would be for the corruption and massive abuse within the church. If we're all sitting here right now and we're unsure if we've ever done enough, in fact, we're sure we haven't done enough, and we're constantly trying to earn grace, just think how susceptible we would all be to the authorities above us that are leading us falsely and not by Scripture. So the people in the Reformation context, the people feel like they're hanging over hell by a thread, and they are desperate to find any way to survive by works. So this becomes a breeding ground for superstition, and I might add, a breeding ground for madness. And part of this madness within the Roman church were the teaching of indulgences and relics. Okay, for example, in Luther's home during the Reformation, Wittenberg, it was a very small town, it was a, and it was a pretty small town, but it hosted a stunning collection of relics. Okay, it was worth the pilgrimage to go to Wittenberg. Why? The castle church had nine aisles proudly displaying more than 19,000 relics, okay? So get this. Part of the relics, you could see the following. You could see a wisp of straw from the crib of Jesus. You could see a strand from Jesus' beard. You could see a nail from the cross. You can see a piece of bread from the Lord's Supper. That, that is impressive. A twig from Moses' burning bush, a few of Mary's hairs, some bits of Mary's clothing, as well as a thousand teeth and bones from celebrated saints, okay? But here's the thing. This is just in Wittenberg. The veneration of each piece was said to be worth a hundred days with a bonus one for each aisle, okay? Meaning, if you did it right, the pious visitor could tot up to more than 1,900,000 days off of purgatory by the end of their visit in Wittenberg. On top of all this, throughout Europe, and this is what makes me laugh. At one point in Europe, there were said to be three heads of John the Baptist floating around, all right? Three heads of John the Baptist in Europe. I mean, that, that's, that's also impressive, all right? Eventually, John Calvin, he would mock the relics, saying this, that there were enough bits of the cross, right? People claim to have a bit of the cross, a piece of wood, a fragment. There were enough bits of the cross in Europe you could build Noah's Ark, okay? <laughs> Luther himself would eventually mock the relics, dripping with sarcasm. He spoke of a collection of relics that had, quote, three flames from the burning bush, half of wing of Archangel Gabriel, and my favorite, two feathers and an egg from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> like this is, this, this is how ridiculous it, it had become. That Luther could not contain himself, again, with dripping with sarcasm over this idea of relics. Then on top of this came the corrupt teachings of indulgences based on the false teaching of purgatory. The teaching came by preying on people who thought they could buy their loved ones out of purgatory, and hence you had the tele-evangelists, so to speak, in their day, going around town to town and preaching what they could. So here's some of the famous phrases that we should know. The tele-evangelist would come to the town, and he would say, you got to save your loved ones from purgatory and death. And he would say this, then you pay some money, and this releases them from purgatory. When the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. And then they also said this. This is, this is now my new favorite. Place your penny on the drum. The pearly gates open and in strolls mom. <laughs> the corruption got so bad that the people weren't even asked to confess sins anymore. They're just asked, give me your money. It's all good. But see, it's all a system of works. It's just a system of works. Whitfield, a product of the Reformation, a few hundred years later, he would say this. Works, works, a man get to heaven by works. I would as soon think of climbing to the moon on a rope of sand. Be hard to do. And that's just how faulty this all is. We are not justified by works. We are justified by faith. 
by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Just look back now at Romans 5, verse 1. Fresh eyes. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Think of how beautiful this verse is. Think of how clear it is. Faith justifies. Faith grants us peace with God through Jesus Christ. Sola fide, loved ones, we are justified by faith. Secondly, sola fide. Sola fide, this, through Christ and into grace. Sola fide, we learn, it's through Christ and it's into grace. Look at verse two now, Romans five. Through him, through Christ, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, okay? Now, did you see it there? Did you see it there? Say, did you see what? Did you see it, the beauty in these verses that we've read so far? This is where, again, my eyes opened in new ways. Let me put this up on the screen for you, verses one and two. Okay, watch this. Okay, this is so fun now. This is where pastor gets pretty excited, all right? Therefore, building off of all that's happened, since we have been justified by faith, sola fide, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, solo Cristo, through him we have also obtained access by faith, solo fide, into this grace, solo gratia, in which we stand, in which we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, solo, soli deo gloria. Amen, church? That's awesome, okay? You want another verse you can do this with this week? Romans 3, verses 23 to 25. You will find many of the solas there too. Check it out. It's awesome. That is so, I did this in my Bible, okay? I did this in my Bible this week because I'm like, I, I just don't want to forget this stuff. It's too good, it's too awesome, it's too real, it's too powerful. Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone, glory to God alone, all revealed in Scripture alone. Notice the first two words of verse 2. Through him, solo Christo, the work is finished through Christ we have access, we have obtained, notice, obtained access by faith. See there, there's the key, there's the key. What? Solo fide. What gives us access? Access means the right to enter, the freedom to enter. You knock on the door, you're not getting in unless you have faith. You're not getting grace. Access to grace by faith, by faith, right in the text, right there. Through Christ, Christ alone, obtained access, how? By faith into this grace. Solo fide, placed upon Christo, gives us access into solo gratia, faith. Faith in what Christ has done. Paul uses the verbs access and to stand in the perfect tense. Now why is that important? Here's why. The reason it's so important, it means that this grace is not just one time. The perfect tense means it's a continual event. It means that believers have an ongoing access to grace and will always continue to stand in grace forever and ever. Amen. This is the reality of solo gratia, received by solo fide. You receive this gift. It's never being taken from you, ever. Real quick on the screen here for you, what it means to be, have access uh, by grace. Number one is this put that one up it's undeserved grace undeserved grace we're, we're we're lost in sin we are we are wretches we deserve to die but we have by solo fide access into gratia grace it's undeserved grace number two is this unconditional grace this isn't something god gives you in his son jesus christ says oh you're bad today i take it from you no once you receive it it's on you forever thirdly it's unbreakable grace this brain this grace, again, cannot be diminished in any way. It stays with you forever and ever. Undeserved, unconditional, unbreakable. This is why in the book of Romans, a few chapters later on, and then Paul says, and nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? See, the beautiful theology is growing and growing and growing. And then the last point, you got to see this again. And this grace is accessed only by soul of faith. Faith. Faith accesses all this grace. Only faith. And what Christ has done, all through Christ and into grace, by faith. And look at the very end of verse 2. 
into this grace in which we stand, never to be removed from that. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And we rejoice in hope. We rejoice in hope in the glory of God. Watch this, loved ones. Where there's true faith, there's true grace. And where there's true grace, it always leads to true glory. Always. Always leads to true glory. Keywords, rejoice, hope, glory. That's the promise and reality of life in Christ. See, at the time of the Reformation, the people were filled with guilt, shame, and condemnation. They could never have true hope. They never had true hope because they never knew if they were saved. They never knew if they were in the place God wanted them to be because they were caught in the system of religion, which is a prison cell of death. Ironically, that's what religion does. It imprisons us with never having any true hope. But then the gospel, the explosion of freedom and life and joy. Why? Because in the gospel, we are guaranteed glory in Jesus Christ. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Think of the power of solo fide. Solo fide placed upon solo Christo. Solo fide then receives solo gratia. And solo fide then guarantees soli deo gloria. Guarantees it. It guarantees it because Jesus Christ died that we might live. That Jesus Christ died that all our sins are washed away as we sang so beautifully today. Jesus Christ died, our faith is in him, and we now have no regrets and no worries, and we are guaranteed that glory is coming our way. Because of solo fide and solo Christa and receiving the gift of solo gratia and the promise of solo Deo gloria, you no longer have any reason to fear death. In fact, death then becomes the entranceway to actually living. And in many ways, then, as believers, in many ways, but Paul says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. You see what's happening here? Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? In Christ, you're not afraid to die. I'm going to be honest with you. A couple of dear saints passed away in our church this week. And part of me was, had a sense of holy jealousy. Part of me, right? Because now their faith has become sight. They fought the good fight. They've finished the race. They, they've kept the faith. These, these two precious, precious saints, I just want to show them to you. Passed away within a day of each other this week. Laura McKay. I mean, if there's a definition of sweetness, Laura, at least when I knew her. All those years, the beginning when Calvary Baptist Church became Harvest Bible Chapel and sweetness of her serving and the grace she extended, the encouragement and the prayers and the love for her family and grandchildren and her husband, Art. And she did well. She wasn't perfect. She was following the one who is perfect. And now she's seeing him face to face, the perfect one, Jesus Christ. It's all worth it. It's all worth it. The very next day, Jim McDougal passed away. What a strong man. What a godly man. Not a perfect man. Following the one who's perfect. A leader. An example. A source of wisdom. A man of faith. Wonderful husband. Tremendous dad. He fought the good fight as well. And he stands before his Savior. Just imagine. Just imagine. It's why we live, man. It's why we live. What are we doing here? What are we doing here? What's the point of all this? What's the point of our lives? What's the point of our hobbies? What's the point of the money we spend? What's the point of all the TV shows we watch? What's the point of all the times in the gym and all the work that we put in and all the paychecks we want to earn? What's the point of it all? Why are we doing it? There's one ultimate purpose for living. Soli Deo Gloria, because the moment you die, as these two precious saints are now realizing, they're seeing it as clear as they've ever imagined in the presence of Christ himself. And all they keep saying is, he's worth it. He's worth it. He's worth it. And Jesus, you are worth it. You are worth it.
See what's happening here? Jesus is happening here. He's once again reminding us as to why we live and how we are to live. Let me just ask you right now, are you here right now and you are not saved in Jesus Christ? Will you honestly wait another second? Will you wait another second to be dying in your pride and your sin when the eternal love of Jesus Christ is offered to you right now that you may never die and you may live forever on it? What could possibly be holding you back from repenting of your sin and embracing the love of Jesus Christ that he will set you free and you might live forever? Say, so how do I do this? It's the whole message, man. Sola fide, faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ. You know, there's some of you here right now that maybe at this moment you've been living a system of religion, maybe for decades. And at this moment, Jesus says, there's been no true relationship. You can start that relationship today. Jesus, I turn from sin. And I place my faith in you, that you lived and you died and you rose again. You take the wheel, Jesus. You take the wheel. I'm done driving. I'm done, dri I'm done dead ends. I'm done getting in the ditch. I'm done flat tires. I'm done broken down engines. I'm done with all that. You, you take the wheel, Jesus. You know where to go. I don't. That's called faith. That's called faith. Solo fide. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Listen, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, give the gift of faith today. I beg you, would you grant the gift of faith that people would be saved here in this place and at this time right now. Work in your church, Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Holy Spirit, would you communicate truths, Lord, that can only be received again by you and for you.